Microsoft is more useful. Anyway, uh, can you put this? Ah, yeah. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Good morning. This Good morning, Jonathan. <laughs> Welcome to this session of the Dynamic Coalition for the Internet of Things. I'll give a short introduction to get us all up to speed on what this is about, and then we'll we'll dive into uh, the, pr the panel di uh, discussion uh, with a couple of introductions, and uh, everybody is invited to participate. Uh, if you have clarifying questions, we'll take those earlier, and discussion is for after the contributions. So with that, uh, I'd like to see the slides. I need to do it from the slide room, okay. I can see it, yeah, we're, we're, we're online. So the Internet of Things is talking, uh, the Dynamic Coalition is really talking about how to get to global good practice on the Internet of Things, a development that has been progressing over many years. Uh, the Internet of Things, for all clarity, is a technology that we need. And it comes with benefits as well as with challenges, like all new technologies. And it offers opportunities to uh, respond to today's challenges in ways that were never possible before, yet it comes with new ones. And just a reminder, preempting uh, any discussion, technologies are not the ones that are good or bad, it's the way we use them. Particularly, we need them for uh, addressing societal issues, also on global level, across borders, and this is a, a a global technology that is adapted globally and is developed globally uh, and adopted uh, locally. So it uh, requires sharing global knowledge about solutions as well as no local knowledge about what needs to happen and action to make things happen, uh, to go beyond talking about it. There's many different applications and just to uh, give a little bit uh, impression of the width, the buoy you see is a tsunami buoy and it's connected and it uh, measures the waves. So this gives the people at the coasts of uh, vulnerable areas just a half hour, hour extra to get away from the coast when necessary. Uh, to under that you see uh, a little uh, sensor that uh, is actually part, can be part of a body, which will sensor your blood pressure changes and will warn you, well, your blood pressure is going up, maybe lay down and call somebody uh, to, 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 to rescue you because there may be a heart attack imminent. Uh, just above that is uh, in-room uh, coal monoxide uh, measurer. You can see there's a lot of different applications uh, ranging from wildlife tracking to uh, autonomous systems uh, that uh, manage uh, networks of uh, roads around cit busy cities. I'm going the wrong way. So we talk about a global approach towards IoT at this global IGF. We've been talking about it in regional IGFs, more focused at the region, that has brought a lot of insight also that uh, global solutions aren't always the best locally or regionally. IoT for us is merely a specific aspect of the internet, just like social media, communication, access to information, and it does link to AI, it does link to big data. Uh, it generates data, it uses data. Specific characteristics that co-determine the development of future network include in particular, the collecting, storing, and providing access to many data related on observation by sensors. It re it's autonomous networks with actuators that take action following receipt of specific data on uh, other uh, 
uh, on, on sensors and to take pre-programmed decision models or learn from it. And AI is a clear uh, component that, that uh, adds to that development and what it can do. IoT is also, because it's physical as well, something that you can actually weaponize. Uh, uh, whether it's uh, domotic devices or other IoT devices to attack third parties. And that is something to be aware of. So these specifics uh, make it different. Uh, Dynamic Collision is set up in 2008. So we celebrate our 15th year and active ever since. Also in regional meetings. And as said, the, the, uh, the aim is to develop global good practice. And the dialogue is about meeting multi-stakeholders on equal terms at global level. The principle that we currently have, and that's always subject to review, is taking ex uh, ethical considerations into account from the outset and find an ethical, sustainable way ahead using IoT to create a free, secure, and enabling rights-based environment, the future we want. In for, for the case of time, uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker today. We both grew older. And uh, this uh, is uh, 2016. Uh, it relates to the fundamentals of the internet. I'm very happy to have Vint Cerf speak here on how that relates to IoT and how that fits into the vision for the future as well. Well, thank you all uh, very much for the invitation to join you. I will have to scoot very quickly because I have a leadership panel meeting to run at 9 o'clock. So my normal one-hour rant will have to be curtailed. Uh, the headline that I want to avoid is 100,000 refrigerators attack Bank of America. And, uh, and unfortunately, we've already had headlines that are similar to that. The Dine Corporation attack from webcams is a good example of that. So the first point I want to make is that standards and interoperability are really critical here. We want multiple manufacturers, devices to interwork, uh, to have compatible kinds of control models. So as consumers of these devices, we can uh, acquire and configure them. Uh, in a way that's useful. Uh, the second thing is that every one of these devices is going to have to have an operating system in it, and we had better uh, insist that the operating systems both be as secure as possible and also be updatable because there will be bugs. They need to be corrected. So the device in, uh, in situ needs to be upgradable uh, to correct for vulnerabilities or to add to new functionality. Strong authentication is absolutely critical for uh, the use of IoT devices. So at the point where you are provisioning the device, uh, putting it into use, it needs to have a strongly authenticated identity, which can be validated remotely. Uh, it also needs to know what other devices it's allowed to talk to. And so we should uh, insist that the device be provisioned to know how to validate an incoming uh, query or an incoming command from another device so that it is not subject to um, uh, takeover by an unauthorized party. Once again, strong authentication and the use of cryptography and digital signatures will be our friend here. The device should have a limited access control list that uh, it, it will listen to and all others uh, it would ignore. Uh, there's a, a scaling issue here because the number of devices that you, you might have in a residence could number in the hundreds uh, in the long term if every light bulb has its own control, for example. And in an, in an industrial setting, we could be talking about thousands of these devices. So configuration management and control needs to be scalable. You don't want to spend the entire week typing IPv6 addresses into these devices to configure them. And so the scaling uh, issue is very important. There's also a dynamic discovery question for some types of these devices. When something shows up that should become part of the uh, residential network or part of the corporate network or the manufacturing network, you'd like to automatically find a way to configure it, but you clearly don't want the wrong parties to be automatically configured in. So in a residential setting, uh, you can imagine a service person coming out to do maintenance. They might have a mobile with them. They might have other devices. You might detect their presence but you have to make the system decide whether or not to incorporate that device into the local control or not. And you might, as the owner of the system, be asked, you know, should I configure the maintenance man's uh, mobile uh, into the household network or not? 
Uh, so once again, we have to have the capability for doing dynamic addition. If you bought a new IoT device, you'd like to make it easy to add that. Um, there are some discussions about uh, what happens when you sell the house that's full of IoT devices. Uh, what does the recipient of the house do? Do we have to reconfigure everything? How do we make that easy to do? Uh, what about voice control? This is increasingly popular. You have lots of devices. Google has the Google Assistant, for example. Uh, the problem with voice control, of course, is that there are risks. Uh, who is allowed to control the device? What are they allowed to do with it? Uh, and you probably want to distinguish among parties with regard to their uh, capacity for controlling the devices. For example, parents might want to have more control than the kids. Although, if your experience is like mine, the kids know more about how to do this than the parents do. Uh, you certainly don't want the casual robber to walk up to the front door and say, open the door, and have it open the door. So uh, voice recognition, which as you know is not 100% reliable, may not be uh, the best way to do this. You may actually have to have some identifier with you that is um, uh, sensible, so to speak, um, by the IoT devices uh, that qualify you for uh, certain capabilities. Um, uh, one interesting problem is guests that come to the house if it's a, in the residential setting. How do you train the house to know what the guests are allowed to do and which guest is it? Do you have to issue little badges to them? Uh, if it's a voice control system, do you have to have them stand in front of a microphone and say a bunch of words so that the system can learn uh, their voice and to correctly interpret that? I mean, it would be kind of a weird thing to invite your guests over for dinner and have them recite in front of a microphone so that they can use the house, get the refrigerator to open, get the toilet to flush, or whatever else that they have to do. Uh, suppose you're standing in a room like this one with a whole lot of light bulbs. Uh, how do you turn one light bulb off or on, or which lights? Do you have to give names like Frank and George and Eddie and then teach the, you know, your guests the, what the names of the light bulbs are? Uh, so we have to find ways of interacting with the system that's easy to learn also, if you give authority to a guest, you don't want that authority to go on longer than they are still welcome guests. And so when they leave the house, the house should forget uh, their ability to uh, access it. So those are just a list of the various things that come to my mind. And I hope in the course of today's session that you'll shed some light on how we achieve some of these objectives of safety and security and reliability uh, and flexibility. Uh, so that the IoT space turns out to be a useful one, both from the point of view of uh, you know, constructive application, but also a big opportunity for companies to design, build, and sell these devices that can interwork with each other. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll stop there and dash out the door. If these were stupid ideas, I'm sure you'll uh, uh, document that. Um, but to the extent that it stimulates your thinking, uh, I hope it's been helpful. Thank you so much, and uh, curious to who would be the next owner of your house and how he would deal with everything you put in place. Well, they'll have to deal with the 3,000 bottles in the wine cellar with the little tags on right, them. Right. That will make up for all the other hassle, no doubt. <laughs> Thank you, Vint, for, for sharing that. Good. If you can go back to the, the, the slides, then allow me to, uh, in a way, put also Vince's uh, remarks into context. Uh, again, uh, the, the thinking and summary is to embrace IoT to address societal challenges in an ethical way. And we need IoT to keep this world manageable. We need it to be inclusive. Deployment needs to be possible where necessary. Uh, this also means in areas where for instance, the, the, the tsunami buoys or, or other uh, agricultural systems where the economics may not naturally uh, offer a business case for a profit industry to, to build. The second thing is to create that IoT system that encour encourages investments. So to do that, you need to involve all stakeholders. There's no single stakeholder holds the key. Uh, regulation is important because you need to understand the legal clarity in which you're going to invest can develop your, your your legal mechanisms, and we realize that nothing happens in isolation or in in a vacuum. There is legislation, but 
how do you deal with it specifically when you develop new applications that are IoT based? Uh, maybe sandboxes, legal sandboxes, is part of the solution there. Um, create ecosystems that are sustainable uh, and inclusive uh, also means uh, understand the issues wherever you go. Uh, they may be different. And stimulate awareness and feedback because people, developments are nowadays so fast that people don't know what's possible. Uh, until years after sometimes. Uh, that's something that uh, res uh, re deserves attention to. So, and as uh, Vint alluded to, if we develop all this and we are in the process, then it needs to be a trusted IoT environment. So, in short, in line with our current uh, good practice document, this means meaningful transparency and you could think of certifiable labels, uh, understandable uh, uh, risks and, and, and how to deal with those uh, with devices and, and uh, bigger systems. Clear accountability, so, so who is responsible? Not, not that obvious always, so it's something that debate needs to progress. And lo and behold, let's, make sure, let's hope there's real choice, no lock-in. And I think that's a point for discussion too. So with that, uh, is Ordi online? Is Ordi online? Uh, it's okay, Ordi, if you're online, unmute uh, please. Good morning, Sally. Um, then uh, uh, Orly was to talk about the impact of AI and IoT. And uh, uh, the core of her contribution is that AI does come with risks, but sometimes these risks are really worthwhile taking. For instance, in medical applications where uh, AI help to improve the quality of life even if they affect the way y y you move around. Uh, and that comes with uh, a lot of ethical aspects uh, as well that are worth all uh, uh, thinking about and exploring. But in the end, it's all about people. And that was the core of her story too. So with that, uh, Hiroshi, I would love to, to hear you to talk about IoT deployment and, the, and your security perspective in how to make that responsibly happen. Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm Hiroshi Saki from Wide Project, Japan. Uh, first of all, regarding the AI, AI really, that's okay. AI really need a trustable data. Otherwise, the uh, AI is going to the very bad behavior. And also interesting for the AI is AI doesn't have any algorithm by himself or by herself. Means their algorithm came from data, right? So we need a very trustful data in order to use AI correctly. Uh, that's the single point regarding the first good item. And also I'm working long time regarding the IoT business, uh, say agriculture or the other industries. Then people are now, Every single industry going to digital twin based on the uh, transparent, interoperable, and trustful data. Right? In order to have the trustful data or transparency of the data, that is really, really important for the governance. How the people using the, using the IoT device or how the IoT device can be manufactured, maintain software and function in it. Therefore, we need a good ownership of the data and devices and the responsibility of the devices uh, in the business field, authenticate as well. <coughs> and also, that's not only on the earth in this day. We are going to include space and moon and Mars. That there's no such a regulation at all at this time. We must have new area to tackle with. Second thing I want to share with you is the IoT 
gonna mutating into IOF. Things are connected, means data are gonna tra travel around on the Earth. The function is the next one from the data. Means that every single function task be able to transfer everywhere if we have the internet. But the completely different from bare metal computer system to cloud computing. So the function be able to travel around on the globe. That's a completely different paradigm means the, uh, the certification or control or management or ethics way of the uh, things must be changed to function. Not the purely devices, physical devices, but uh, what kind of process gonna run over any single device. So we must labeling, labeling, or certificating not device, but a function or software running on the hardware device. That is an important thing, I, I believe. And also, in order to have a secure or safe operation, we need labeling or certification or authentication. Then scalability is quite in, in important. I always talk with the government, they want to control everything, but that is not scalable. Therefore, we need a very clever, scalable system in order to have such a labeling or uh, you know, uh, certification for secure, safe IoT or IRF devices. The third thing, third, third point I wanna share with you is that we have new stakeholder. As uh, Martin mentioned, agricultural people Fishery people <coughs> or the other people, they are not came from IT or ICT arena. They completely have the different culture and terminology. When when I talk with them, completely different language, dif completely different structure of the industry, I have to talk with them. That is a new challenge, and also we welcome the new, you know, stakeholders come together, that is a in principle of the uh, IGF itself. <coughs> so I really want to say that is a new players gonna come in, in the field. The other interesting for this focusing on, when we focus on the IOT, IOT device requires very small latency in many cases. In the case of internet, we allow 100 milliseconds Right, <coughs> in order to see the uh, video, CDN providing you say 10 milliseconds. But the robot requires microseconds. You must feel speed of lights, size of the earth. In the case of IoT application, it may be called as edge computing. The completely different requirement they ask to us for the computer system at all. Then IoT went to the IOF, then more zero trust capabilities required because every single device be able to travel around over the globe, then you know air gap or firewall protection of provision doesn't work well. Of course that is be a useful technique so every single device must have their trust capability in the future. Otherwise, we cannot enjoy IoT or IOF. Then the last one would be a IoT device or uh, you know every single data for the digital twin has a huge contribution to a carbon neutral decarbonization because we must grasp what's, what's going on on the earth, what's going around you, we need a data. It must be trustable, must be transparent. Otherwise, we cannot live with healthy Earth. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, linking it very much to where we are today, the challenges today. Uh, uh, and one would still think whether there's different levels of devices that have different requirements in terms of uh, both uh, carbon neutrality and security, I would say. Uh, but we'll l hear more about it. We'll also have a uh, contribution later on about LoRa networks and how they can play in. 
So with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Sarah uh, Kaiden is a researcher who's been uh, uh, just uh, getting her PhD in uh, design. And uh, congratulations with that, Sarah. And I uh, really would like to hear about your insights uh, from that perspective on IoT and how to make it deployable uh, wherever it's needed. Um, hi, everyone. I, I hope you can hear me well. <laughs> Good evening from my end. So uh, my name is uh, Sarah Kiden, and I would like to start with two things right now, and um, I'll maybe we'll, I'll add on some more later. Uh, the first one is that as we develop uh, guidelines for IoT as the dynamic coalition or really any group that's developing guidelines, we need to acknowledge that there are power asymmetries in the IoT ecosystem. So if you think about it, there are people who build, who develop the IoT devices, there are people who use these devices in the context of consumer IoT, and there are people who are impacted by the devices. So the impact could be positive, like uh, what Martin was talking about earlier, where your med medical IoT device notifies your health practitioner and you're able to get immediate help or it could be negative in a way that um, perhaps um, an IoT device has been used, for example, to facilitate gender-based violence. Uh, there's a group I follow at uh, University College London that's doing very interesting research about um, how IoT is being used to facilitate gender-based violence. So these power uh, imbalances could manifest at different stages. So at the design phase or research phase where I am currently, um, if, for example, I interview participants and I'm analyzing uh, data, the insights that I could draw are based on maybe what I'm interested in or what I see or um, just acknowledging that as, uh, as a designer or as a researcher, I come with biases. So things that stand out to me could be underlying infrastructure that supports IoT, access to electricity, access to a network, and so on and so forth, but it might be different for someone else. So at that point, it means the designer or engineer has the power to make design decisions. Um, at another point, it could be a funder, for example, so they are giving you money to do particular IoT work, and you have uh, obligations for the grant agreement. So that means that the interest now lies with the funder. So I think we need to have some sort of mechanism um, for accountability and responsibility uh, so that the power is not misused. But to also think about if the consumers have any power at all, uh, if they have it, how are they using it? If not, how can we empower consumers to actually influence future deployments? Um, the second thing I would like to talk about is something I've seen happening in, in the AI space. So organizations like the Algorithmic Justice League, Data and Society, and Amnesty International, among others, are now beginning to document AI harms. So they're actually collecting uh, user stories about a harm that's happening to them. Uh, it could be a hiring decision. It could be maybe they were not considered for a loan or a tenancy application, and so on and so forth. It's something that I think as um, the IoT, uh, people who are interested in IoT design and in, uh, deployment, we could think about. And these, um, like these can serve as evidence. So basically um, you can use that to create design guidelines. If I use the previous example where IoT devices are facilitating gender-based violence, if out of 500 reports, 100 are about a particular thing, then you could think about how to uh, to implement safety, for example, for uh, smart IoT devices. Or you could nudge policymakers in a particular di direction. So you tell them um, maybe the way the law is written currently, you cannot litigate a particular issue, and maybe we need to amend the law so that we can um, cover some of the things. So this is like initial thoughts that I have, and I'm happy to add some more later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, and uh, also for illustrating the differences and the different requirements in different areas that, that, that happen. Uh, one of the examples we talked about in the preparation was, for instance, that data protection is uh, legislation existing in many countries, but not in all. Does it mean everything goes in those countries where no data protection legislation is yet in place? 
it's uh, one of the things if uh, you think about it on global level uh, is important to address uh, with that is the next person is Alejandro online okay Alejandro are you uh, you're, you're online are you here Sorry, my computer died yes. because I don't have electricity on it anymore. Ouch. And so, uh, yes, Alejandro Pesanti present here. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Alejandro Pisanti from the National University of Mexico in Mexico City. Uh, today I am in Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, pleased to, to be with you. Uh, first, I would like to uh, very briefly address one point that Sarah Kiden has made. Uh, which is who are the the, the 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 entities exerting power through IoT, and I think the, there's uh, there's room for more detailed analysis. We certainly can think. First of all, I think Martin, as we have spoken previously, and uh, others, uh, we have to distinguish between consumer Internet of Things and industrial Internet of Things. Um, the consumer Internet of Things is. Uh, a major concern for security, for example, as Vincent stated at the beginning of the session, you don't want your refrigerator to be responsible for launching missiles somewhere uh, or a DDoS attack on, 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 on a major government. Uh, and the people exerting power in that sphere are not necessarily the ones we think of usually in, in, in a north-south divide. It's more probably a company in a large country uh, which is not uh, acting all the time in the in the in the system of rules. It doesn't have a large uh, transnational structure, but it's more li likely a lot of small companies making uh, devices that are sold at a very low price to consumers, uh, to consumers that are not necessarily aware of the need to secure their devices. And uh, the devices aren't even possible to secure because you don't have uh, any access to them. You don't have any access even to passwords and certainly not as been mentioned to their operating systems and other uh, underlying layers so we need to split that kind of analysis into more uh, different categories uh, now the main point uh, for which i was invited to this session uh, is to uh, link with the dynamic coalition on core internet values with the question whether uh, the Internet of Things uh, can have an impact on core Internet values, on, on, on the way the Internet's core values are dis deployed, displayed, or challenged. Uh, we remember that some of these core Internet values are the layered architecture, packet switching, which are like sort of underlying assumptions. And then we have uh, the best effort hypothesis the, or assumption. We have uh, interoperability, openness, and so forth. And what we see first is that the deployment of devices uh, in the consumer Internet of Things, which do send their packets and data over the open public Internet, uh, are a challenge already in, uh, to openness, uh, sometimes to interoperability. Certainly, they are uh, increasing the load on the systems, and they are, have increased the attack surface for everybody as uh, has seen in many examples where, for example, a specific model of surveillance cameras, uh, you know, standard facilities, uh, CCTVs, uh, can be weaponized uh, for denial, uh, distributed denial of service, for example. And we have a further very complex challenge uh, in the standards and layers field, where uh, the standards for communicating the technologies and standards for communicating Internet uh, of Things devices, both uh, consumer and industrial, uh, use a lot of different technologies. They use, for example, LoRa, they use open Wi-Fi, they use 4G, they will use 5G or even 6G if they come uh, for different sets of or, or segments of their communications and for backups for some of those. As uh, Hiroshi Sa Saki has uh, already mentioned, uh, the requirements, for example, may be of microseconds. So you may need to have VPNs or dedicated links that subtract bandwidth. Uh, some telcos may decide to sell you, uh, you know, bandwidth.
important with that's uh, reserved that uh, that this is one of the big discussions around the six gigahertz band for example uh, how you split it into the open part and into the restricted or registered part uh, so these are these are important challenges and uh, no single manufacturer of these devices uh, will uh, will care about these open internet effects or the effects of uh, interoperability as long as their devices work and sell so we have to find a way to make awareness and part of this will have to be in consumers one last point is uh, some of these uh, issues have been uh, uh, set up and uh, there's an attempt to address them by for example warnings to consumers or registrations or standards bodies but a lot of these things are sold under the radar of national standardization bodies and of uh, commercial regulations so people just pick them up in, uh, in in a mobile market and put them into a network without having to comply with any any standards of the let's say national telecommunications authority or regulator and uh, nor anything else uh, so th at least this is a way of uh, making a list an inventory of the challenges and giving giving them some hierarchy so that we know that some of the solutions proposed may really be very limited in reach or unworkable at all thank you thank you very much for your perspective uh, very much informed by the work also of the, the NEMA coalition for core internet values uh, really appreciate it um, then can I check with you whether you're available to speak to labeling and certification? Ben, ben Kaffee? You, you're unmuted. Yes, thanks, Martin. Thank you. Then is uh, based in Washington DC and he's been involved in uh, the work of the dynamic coalition for a long time and he's also involved in a White House initiative to, to, to look into labeling and certification so please then the floor is yours thank you Martin uh, I'm trying to find my camera Is that better? We see you. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> and um, uh, thanks for, uh, for, for pulling this together um, and for your, <clears throat> your continued uh, leadership. Um, I think one of the issues that, 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 ties this to, that ties a lot of things together um, quite well that have been, have been mentioned by other speakers, um, uh, you know, the, the issue of power asymmetry and uh, how, how, how consumers uh, have some idea of, of what's happening with the Internet of Things so their devices uh, is, is something that, that we've observed in the United States and it's also happening in, in, in other parts of the world. But the, um, the effort to uh, bring uh, consumer labeling uh, to the Internet of Things, and so we've we've there's there's been a real push in the United States a public-private partnership, uh, which was an, uh, announced uh, by the White House uh, uh, back in uh, the summer, um, which is is being uh, uh, the responsible party in the United States is the Federal Communication uh, Commission, which is sort of our equivalent of the telecom regulator. Um, and the idea is, uh, you know, to have a widely available uh, uh, consumer label on on packaging for devices that gives a consumer some sense of, you know, the the, the this the security sort of how this what what level of security is offered on the on the particular device. How to you know how to update the security, how to upgrade it, um, and then how to become uh, you know more more aware, uh, because I think there's a there's a growing appetite, especially on the uh, at the consumer level, uh, for uh, you know what 
what, what is what is the device that that I'm buying? Um, what you know? What is the capability? And so you know, uh, there there are other other uh, uh, parts of the world and other speakers um, um, that are that are going to speak to this later. I know we had a regional IGF in uh, Australia uh, where this was the topic of uh, of discussion. But I think it's something that's reflective. The, the idea of the consumer label is something that's reflective of the, the the dynamic coalition itself, which is it's 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 a very positive development. It's something that we've all been working on, working hard on for a very long time. Uh, but I think it also, uh, you know, gives the 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 possibility um, in terms of of some of the labeling efforts for international. Uh, harmonization, which goes to Vince's point about interoperability and and standards. So, with with the label in the U.S., we're not we're not talking about creating a standard. It's a public-private partnership that will be run by the Federal Communication uh, Commission and by you know interested um, stakeholders. So, view it as a very uh, positive development and hope that it's something that that we can continue to work on in the in the dynamic coalition and see it become uh, more globally accepted. Thank you, Dan, for that. And, and uh, the US is not the only one, as, as said. Uh, there's national initiatives. There's also uh, initiative by IEEE to, to, to look into how to do this. They're currently all uh, very explorative, I would say. Uh, but with uh, deep intent. Good morning, Wout. Um, next uh, speaker, uh, if we can get uh, uh, Sandush. Can you make Sandush Balakrish uh, a non uh, co host? He will speak instead of Lucien uh, yeah. Kastix. Yeah, good morning, Matan. Can you hear me? We can hear you very well, and I asked the the the, the support. Uh, sorry for this very last minute request. Uh, so uh, and they made you co-host, so you can also present your slides if you want to. Good morning. Yeah, that will be fine. Yep. So I have s slides, but um, I will not take much time. I hope you can see my slides. We can see your slides in presentation mode. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Martin. So, uh, you know, in the opening statement uh, of Windsurf, uh, he talked about IoT needing uh, interoperability, scalability, etc. And uh, Professor Yusaki also said about the zero trust necessity for IoT. So both these uh, presentations are quite a preamble for this one. So here, uh, you know, uh, we are looking at zero trust from a identity management angle. So to have identity and access management using DNS is a perspective that we are looking at AFNIC. AFNIC is the .fr registry that I am working at. We are based in Paris. Uh, so the DNS, the domain name system, is a system that is used by most internet users for internet communication and it is to simplify it is just mapping uh, a human uh, human based names like domain names to IP addresses so most of us we use uh, DNS for our internet communication so what we are trying to have a look is that how to use the same system that is being mostly used in the internet for IOT based so you know uh, zero trust, if we say briefly what NIST uh, proposes is that you can have communication from a device to the network uh, on a case-by-case -case basis where you can have context, where you can have different administrative access. It is not, and you don't need to provision early. So uh, we also see that whether we could do the same with uh, DNS. So, um, uh, you know, 
uh, this is a use case that we see usually in IoT. You know, uh, the device maker, he, they provision the devices with some keys, and these keys need to be shared among the stakeholders uh, over the ecosystem. So that's a huge issue. It's an operational nightmare. Uh, so the, the use of symmetric key it, it works in the IoT, but it doesn't scale. So that's a problem that we are trying to solve here. So we try to work with the LoRa. LoRa is the long range wide area network. Why did we try to work with LoRaWAN is that LoRa is, comes under the classification of LPWAN, low power wide area networks. It is one of the most constrained networks in IoT. And if our proposition works in LoRaWAN, it will work around the other IoT uh, networks and devices. So we were able to do you know, the communication between the different servers uh, in, in a LoRaWAN scenario using mutual authentication. When I say mutual authentication is that both the client and server authenticate each other. And this could be done by a by normal asymmetric keys that we use in the internet, that is public and private keys. And how we do them is that we, we do with self-signed certificates. And in the self-signed certificates, uh, we are able to do this mutual authentication e even when we don't have the certificate authority. For example, in the internet, we need to have a certificate authority and that certificate authority needs to be authorized by the browser vendors. But here we could do that in the DNS without having a certificate authority and having your own self-signed certificate. That is done, I'll go here, that is done, that, that is done thanks to a, a, a technology standardized by the IETF, it's called DANE, DNS Authentication of Named Entities. And I, I will not go deep into it, but it just shows that in the DNS, you can provision both the identity resolution as well as which key you have to authenticate. So here with the help of DNS and DANE and DNSSEC, we don't need a certificate authority ecosystem. We can use the uh, DNS ecosystem for both identity and access management. So we have tested that with the TLS 1.3. We even did a hackathon at the IETF. Uh, so the next step that we are going to do is that, so he, I'm coming back to here is that we have zero trust capability here because we don't need provisioning a priori by keys or by having a certificate authority. You can do that dynamically. And with the DNS, you have scalability. And you can use the existing identifiers because if you see in the IoT, there are different identification systems like barcode, RFID, NFC, uh, et cetera, and et cetera. So all these different types of identifications could interoperate with each other. Uh, we have worked with the, G with the supply chain GS1 standards also. So we tested with them also. So at AFNIC, uh, we are building on a dynamic identity management system based on DNS, and we have built blocks by blocks on different projects that we have. As you can see in the slides, it's like a Lego uh, block. We started with the, uh, whether to see whether we could provision different identifiers in the, uh, in the DNS. When I say different identifiers, it could be a digital object identifier, it could be an object identifier, it could be an RFID, it could be a barcode, it could be a domain name, et cetera, URI, et cetera. So that works, we work with the supply chain industry. Then we see whether all these identifiers could resolve with the different ecosystems, that also works. Now with the security, we have added one more layer and we are now working in a, another project called Pivot where we want to add privacy features based on DNS. So that's how we plan to do that. And I hope we could also work with a, a dynamic coalition on adding this thing here. I have for, for information, uh, there are different standardization organizations like the IETF, the IT, ITU, all working with the same scenario, looking at DNS for resolving the issues that we see in the IoT normally. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm ready to answer. Thank you, uh, Sandosh, for that. Uh, we saw startup organizations like ITU. I'm not sure ITU qualifies as a startup organization, but uh, uh, thanks for what you do, because basically what uh, also Sandosh uh, brings in 
is the fact that uh, what is IoT? Is it a device? Is it a cyber physical system which brings together a couple of devices? Or is it an ecosystem of an uh, application, a coherent one, uh, in which the self-certification may be, be qui quite part of the solution to make sure it's a secure system? Uh, the other element is also with the LoRa networks, is that whereas IoT is an extension of the internet, it doesn't mean that every IoT application needs streaming video cap capabilities. Sometimes it's enough to ping once every five minutes or even once every hour what's happening. Uh, with that, uh, uh, Lucien also, uh, uh, sorry, Sandush presentation can be shared as well, right? Yeah, it can uh, be shared, yeah. Super. So, so uh, uh, come to me after the meeting if you want, uh, and I'll send it by email. And uh, but we'll also make sure that with the report, that will be very clear where you can find uh, the presentations uh, later on. Uh, thanks for bringing this uh, aspect, uh, zero trust, uh, self-signed certification is part of the solution, and uh, the awareness that uh, yeah, different networks will facilitate IoT systems in different environments. Um, that is one, one of the technical component, but also we need another, you know, more wider thing. Uh, otherwise, you know, not only the uh, name domain or IP address, but the other part we, we need. Uh, uh, j just to answer to Professor Isaki, uh, you know, we did work with the supply chain industry on GS1 type of identifiers. When I say GS1, it is uh, barcode and RFID. And if you see with the LoRaWAN, we are working with uh, MAC IDs. So it's not just uh, names and the IP addresses here. So how to also deal with, uh, and uh, what you said also, to deal with privacy issues in systems that uh, have very little extra capability of uh, sharing data. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, with us also, uh, Wout de Natris, he's coordinator of the IS3C uh, Dynamic Coalition. And that the, uh, the coalition has done research into uh, legislation and policy initiatives in IoT uh, and has recently launched a report, or yesterday uh, launched a report uh, on, on uh, findings and, and commonalities uh, with that, and even has some recommendations. Wout, would you be willing to share? Be glad to, Martin. thank you. Uh, my name is Wout Natris, and I'm a consultant in the Netherlands, and as such, coordinator of a dynamic coalition called Internet Standard Security and Safety Coalition within the IGF. As as Martin said, we had our session yesterday and published two reports and launched a toolkit for internet standard deployment. Um, I was late here because I was another session on IoT presenting on our work and then got a ping from Martin to come here. The chair of the working group is presenting as we speak in that session so that I'm taking his place basically here to, to share his results. Um, very short, what is IS3C? We started this dynamic coalition in 2020 with the idea to get the internet standards that are out there for sometimes decades and would make the internet far more secure and safer if they were massively deployed by industry, most of the time by industry. And for some reason that is not happening. So how can we make the world more secure and safer? That is by incentivizing organizations to deploy these existing standards. And that is what we do our work on. So we have several working groups and then I'll get to the IoT part, but we do work on security by design, Internet of Things. We do work on education and skills, on tertiary education, whether they teach these standards, how the internet works, etc. There's a huge gap there. Procurement by government and industries, are they demanding these internet standards? We have a working group on, on uh, emerging technologies, which will probably start in 2024 and we have a working group on the deployment of RPKI and DNSSEC, and not because the technical problems they have, but how can we change the narrative so that when a, a CEO or a CFO or a secretary general has to make a decision within his organization that he understands why he has to go for security, and not because of the technique, whether it got political or economical or social or security motivation. 
So we have a working group that's going to start in November. Oh, sorry, in December we are in, what was it, in October. Where are we? <laughs> I forgot where we are. <laughs> We're in October. It's going to start in November. And uh, the hopefully we'll have a result there uh, the early next year. So what did we do with IoT? Because that's the reason I'm sitting here. We came up with a plan to do research into policy documents that are findable on the internet and to do a comparison. And as I understand, they found documents from 18 countries, in total 30 documents in 18 countries, mostly from the global north, with 442 different practices in them. So between 18 countries, there were 442 practices. And do they align sometimes the terminology is even explained in a different way. So there's no coherence between these policy documents. And that is, the I think, the first thing that I want to say. Um, I'm going to put on my glasses because it reads a little bit easier. But what they did is they studied it from four categories. They looked at it from data privacy and confidentiality. They looked at secure updating. They looked at they looked at the user empowerment and operational resilience. And from those four categories, they had five research questions. And the first one is, what are the recommended best practices for setting out the responsibilities of all stakeholders involved in IoT security, including manufacturers, service providers, and users? The second question is, what policy and regulatory measures can be identified for promoting, I promoting IoT security by design, and specifically with regard to ensuring device resilience against crashes, power shortages, and outages. Three, what policy and regulatory guidelines can be identified to promote user empowerment in IoT security, and what are the recommended best practices for implementing vulnerability disclosure mechanisms? Four, through what mechanisms are regulators and policymakers enforcing compliance with established IoT security standards and encouraging manufacturers to adopt the recommended best practices? And five, how do policy and regulatory documents relate security updates with warranty policies for IoT devices and services? So there's a lot of questions that they put out on these 30 different documents. They found a lot of things, but when they started grouping them, things became quite clear very soon. So what were the main conclusions to be drawn? That one, IoT security is complex and multi-faced. Issues with require a comprehensive approach. Many countries, including the whole of the global south, lack any policy framework for IoT security. And that is almost, there are a few exceptions. Many of the national practices identified did not match other countries' policies, and there are many differences in taxonomy, taxonomy. Many of the practices are voluntary guidelines without effective accountability and consequences for non-deployment. National administrations rarely require or specify security by design in the hardware and software that they produce or procure, sorry, and this would drive and increase the deployment of security-related standards. The standards that form the public core of the internet, which is basically software, and on which the internet runs, are not formally recognized as such by governments, and are usually absent in all policy documents such as analyzed in this research. Specifying links between security flaws and device integrity is a strong basis for security updates. So that is the findings, and as you can see, there are huge gaps between when we talk about cybersecurity and what is actually being addressed by these governments. And that leads to a certain se set of recommendations. And the first one is accountability frameworks from the design stage through to use. Two, strategies for countering on authenticated vulnerabilities such as denial of service attacks. Three. Stakeholder cooperation on coordinating vulnerability disclosure. Four, endorsing global implementation of open standards. <coughs> Five, the inter integration of security updates and warranty policies. 
Uh, finally, governments get your act together and agree on what a term and a definition is of a specific, a specific piece of IoT. So, can we actually change this situation? And if I look back at the whole Dynamic Coalition in all other studies that we found, as I said, already said, the public core of the internet is something governments discuss and they think that it should be protected and it should not be attacked. And my idea is, and that is my personal idea from reading the different reports we're producing, is that governments think of the cables of the server parks, they think of the undersea cables that they have to be protected. And what they forget is what the internet, what makes the internet actually function and work as it does. So if governments don't recognize it, it will also mean that they won't procure it. So if what would make the IoT or other functionings of the internet more secure is when a government starts putting its money where its mouth is. In other words, if you want cybersecurity, you will have to demand certain standards to be built in the product that you are actually procuring. So if you do not demand it up front, in some cases you can't even get it afterwards after the, the, you discover the, 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 the vulnerabilities because they can't be mended or they don't do it or because it's an end of life cycle for them. So in other words, you have to consider these standards up front. And so that only when bigger organizations, public and private, start demanding security by design when procuring, that is the moment that things will change in the world. And that will also mean that for us as individual users, they're not going to pr produce two sort of coffee machines that connect with the in internet. They will all be secure from that moment onwards because they won't sell secure things to the government and insecure to us. If consumer organizations would start testing these devices, also on the IoT component, also that would prove a lot of things. So that is where we try to work with as IS3C. But when all else fails, then I'm convinced that there will be only one solution, and that is that they're going to regulate it and legislate it. And if that is a desirable, des desirable thing to happen, I'm not so certain about that, but it will happen between now and five to six years. So it's time to get our act together. And that act can be by deploying what is out there and can't be that difficult, I'm told. So let me stop there, Martin, and <coughs> happy to answer any questions later. Yes, thank you for that, uh, Wout. Uh, what we see is uh, the rapid developments make it more and more difficult also for governments to keep up with what they should do. And legislation is just one of the, is a, uh, the, the, the last resort, one would say. Uh, very much uh, appreciate the concept that comes forward that uh, uh, procurement might be uh, a way in. If uh, governments know how to procure for safe, secure IoT devices, they may also better know how to propose legislation or guidelines uh, to the rest of uh, the, the public. Uh, thank you, thank you for that the, that insight. And uh, I also heard you having listened to to Vint. Uh, let's think about the world we want, but also act. Otherwise, we may end up with the world we deserve. And we may not like that. I, I loved that uh, quote. Uh, the last element I, I really would like to bring in uh, and to emphasize further, because it's a key element, not only of the society we live in, but also specifically for IoT, is how to deal with uh, privacy and data protection. And for that, uh, I have my friend and colleague Jonathan Cave uh, online, uh, who also volunteered to be rapporteur for this session. Um, but uh, he's uh, an expert uh, with a policy background, regulatory background, and uh, a, a microeconomist and game theorist. Uh, Jonathan. Okay, thank you, Martin. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's coming up on two o'clock in the morning here, so I will attempt to be coherent. Um, there were a couple of, not, not to preempt the discussion, I think it's useful if we get quickly into the main issues, but there are a few things I wanted to say in relation to privacy. I think 
from the perspective of the economics of privacy, from the perspective of the ethical aspects, and certainly from the legal perspective, one of the questions that keeps coming up through this discussion is whether the things that we're talking about, and I include privacy in this, but also things we've talked about today like security, transparency, and accountability are meant to be principles that we uh, adhere to or espouse when we get a chance, or are meant to be mechanisms that produce a result. Because the internet of things linked into the internet of people is a complex adaptive system. It produces things that we can't yet imagine. And so the engineering perspective of designing things which have specific characteristics and functions and so on, and then you turn them loose and judge them according to how well they do those things for users who are deemed to have fixed characteristics may not be the most useful perspective. So I just wanted to flag up this sort of game theoretic view that all the things we're talking about are mechanisms and then make a few observations that are relevant, I think, to the internet of things. Some of these are things that have been said before. For example, we know we need to have multiple stakeholders, but it's important to be quite clear on who those stakeholders are, what kind of voice we want them to have, and what sort of decisions we involve them in. One of the problems that's come up, particularly with the use of AI, in relation to the Internet of Things, is the question of whether agency is still a useful concept in the sense that we had it before, where we can base an entire system of markets, engineering, and laws on the idea of people being told what they can do and then being held responsible for how they do it. Now, in this respect, I think one of the elements here is the privacy element, and I'll just sort of round in on that and we can discuss other things later on. When we talk about privacy, the central question is privacy of what? And why is this a useful idea? In most cases, we start from the perspective of the privacy of data. But we've heard um, all the way through, uh, it was hinted at by Vint and certainly picked up quite strongly by Hiroshi and everybody who spoke later, that when we talk about the internet of things, we're probably talking about the data plane certainly when AI comes in there, because you can't understand what these things or complex assemblages of these things do without understanding how they learn, you know, how they were trained, what data they were trained on. Then there are the devices themselves. Are they secure? Do they fit certain um, characteristics? Can they be updated and so on? That's the hardware, and it includes the software as it changes over time. Then there are the functions. But because the Internet of Things contains things that are connected to each other, those functions may not be well or objectively defined. What I use the device for is not necessarily the function that you see. The function that you see may be entirely different. For example, these IoT devices that harvest vast amounts of personal private information from their users, even when that has no connection to the nominal functioning or design of the device or its operation. Uh, the cars that observe whether we're sleepy or whether we're behaving well, that kind of thing. So the, as we move up the plane, away from the data plane and the device plane, things become, as it were, more complicated. And that produces a changing surface, not just an attack surface for cybersecurity, but a surface for, let's call it, ethical concerns. Now, so that's item one, which is the complexity of the things. We can engage with these things at certain levels, but they have implications at other levels. Now, I think this is important in terms of the good practice elements of what we want to see for the IoT. Many of us come from engineering or analytical backgrounds, but as many others have pointed out, a lot of the people making decisions here may not share those perspectives and that's not just something we have to patch together as a kind of human interoperability, but it's part of the richness and resilience of the system that we have and give expression to those different perspectives. But that brings me to the second aspect of the privacy, which is the privacy of action and intention. When people use these devices, they develop relationships with them and through them different relationships with each other. 
When people use a smart speaker, for example, they begin to trust it in certain ways. Now, partially, that gives the speaker or the people feeding data and instructions to the speaker um, a power that they didn't have originally. They move from being sensors, as it were, or deliverers of content to being actuators, to, to reprogramming their users. And that perfectly innocent function has really profound implications for who gets uh, held responsible for these things. Now, another uh, small comment I wanted to make that came up um, early on in the conversation was the question of how we control and own the data. For a long time, we've been told that you can't own data and can't own personal data. But of course, now we learn that in order to make these systems function, we have to resurrect that notion of the ownership of data simply so that we can hold people uh, responsible. Then the final thing I wanted to talk about was the nature of our ethical engagement. We can do certain things with law, certain things with standards and certification, but behind that, there needs to be an appropriate ethical framework. Most of our frameworks are based on what Martin called at the very beginning, respect for the individual. But what we're beginning to learn is that the individual, at least as they interact with the world, is not a kind of fixed entity. It's not an anchor point for ethical reflection. So if I give you voice and if I give you respect, am I doing it for you right now or the you that you will become when you interact with these systems? And if it is the latter, how do we take account of the fact that the way the systems operate changes the way people use them, changes the way people understand them. Now, as an economist, I believe that this richness of perspectives is not something that we can resolve or standardize, but is instead a source of resilient interaction that helps us to understand the kinds of things that we see. So in that respect, I won't, uh, I'll, I'll close at this point simply by saying that I think that we need to work on the ethical dimension to understand whether concepts like privacy uh, still serve us as useful principles or need to be modified, particularly in light of the fact that we now have different understanding of how our individual and collective psychology is affected by interacting with devices, which at the one time are mechanical devices, but at the same time are AI-empowered entities with whom we form relationships, who change our behavior, our understanding, and the things that we pay attention to. Thank you so okay. much, uh, Jonathan, for sharing your insights uh, on this journey. Basically, it's also amazing how, how quickly our insights and what good practice should be like is evolving. And then we know the next step is to implement it in society. But uh, also walking around in this IGF, uh, I heard a lot of things I thought are really, truly uh, getting us to next levels of understanding of how to deal with systems. Now, uh, for the sake of time, I first would like to ask uh, Avri, are there any questions online? No, there haven't been any, any questions online unless one just came in. But uh, so please, if anybody wants to put one in the chat or the Q QA, I can read it. And, and please be short, because we only have 15 minutes left because we put so much content in the first part. But if anybody puts anything in chat, I'll read it. Okay, the content was based on interactions in several regional events. So in that way, uh, the, the voice of people has been heard and reflected. But we look forward to the voices here in the room. Barry, please, please introduce yourself. Yes, this is Barry Lieber. Um, I've been working on some Internet of Things related stuff for almost 25 years now from before we called it Internet of Things. And I've, so I've got a lot of thoughts on it. I'll try to condense it to two points that I want to make. We talk about security, and I don't like using that term as a buzzword. Um, it's much more complex, and I think we need to think about it broken down into uh, different aspects, uh, authentication, authorization, confidentiality, data integrity, all, all those sorts of things, because putting that all together makes a much more complicated picture, especially when we go to the second point I want to make, that when we talk about turning on lights with our voice or even something that's um, more dear to me as I age of the example you gave of uh, Martin of uh, 
uh, monitoring my blood pressure or my heart rhythm or something like that. It's still just something we've been able to do for a long, long time, but now it communicates over the internet. Um, to me, that's not the internet of things in its full potential. What I think of as internet of things is different sources all working together. Uh, my car and my house and my calendar and you know my, my calendar resets my alarm clock and makes coffee earlier and tells my car where to go in the morning and that kind of stuff and that really makes the security all those different aspects of it very complicated to put together and as we think about making a secure internet of things and a private and a confidential and whatever internet of things we really need to think about the the real robust scenarios and, and the complexity that that puts into it of um, how to secure all these different pieces and make sure that uh, the data doesn't leak and all of that uh, sort of thing. So. Thank you very much, Barry. Uh, Hiroshi, please. Yes, um, I think the, uh, the core part of the internet on the end is should be the same, the end-to-end -end principle. I mean, the uh, end-to-end -end means protect yourself first by yourself. Community second. The last one is public health. So uh, the core part of the internet, try to making a secure, good operation as a backhaul, ba backhaul network, then end station must have their own protection first. Then, you know, that is the really, really good thing for we need a traceability or interoperability. The meaning of interoperability is user must have such a capability. That's the education, okay, you know, capacity building or literacy bu building up. And uh, then one of the action we are doing in Japan is the uh, pro providing traceability to user. Not all, but uh, people can have the traceability function then how many person gonna gonna use? That really depends on the uh, you know that technology usable and how we you know deploy or how to advocate those these technologies. Then again, end to end is very powerful scalability. So that's the way we should do. Lot, please. Um, thank you, Barry, for, uh, for the question. Um, I think it shows how complex our life is going to be. It's going to be much worse than this, probably not too long from now. But the question is, where do we put the accountability, basically, or the, 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 the responsibility? And despite that the end user has a role to play here, we can be 100% certain that 99% of the people won't even know how to protect themselves because they think this device works. My car drives, and that 170 machines, just like ET, phone home in that car the whole time. You have no clue that it's happening, except when you get a very strange message all of a sudden in your car saying, what do I have to do? <laughs> but that shows what happens today, and it's all about the companies gathering the data. And because of that, it's insecure, because otherwise it's probably harder to get the data for them. But we have to work, or as a society, we have to work a way around that somehow because otherwise we will probably lost forever where from a pri privacy point of view but also from the attack vector point of view because that is the other s the dark side can abuse this 24 7 hours a day uh, sorry the percent you're going 20 24 7 but you know what i mean so i think that that is why why it's so important to make sure that standards are installed at the outset and otherwise it will probably never happen and we have to start working to make that happen thank you thanks for that uh, very much uh, uh, mark please yeah thank you martin uh, mark carvel i'm a member of eurodig which is the european regional internet governance forum i'm also an advisor to the is3c coalition on standards, security, and safety. So a colleague of uh, Bout de Matris on the panel. And uh, first of all, thanks very much for a very interesting and wide-ranging uh, discussion. A couple of points sprang to mind. And first of all, a quick question to Dan about labeling 
schemes and harmonization, um, where does he think the best platform is for developing harmonization, given that uh, people are going to be traveling around the world with devices and they need to be uh, able to uh, understand a coherent uh, universal labeling scheme. So where is, the, where is the platform best placed for that? I did bump into somebody from the FCC on, my, on, on the Sunday, I think it was. Uh, so there is, uh, and I, n I noted what Dan said about uh, FCC involvement in, in the US uh, public-private partnership. So uh, maybe if I'd known about this, I would have asked him, you know, <laughs> perhaps if the FCC had some thinking about this, and maybe that's one of the reasons why he's here, that particular person. So that was that fir a first point. Um, now, procurement that uh, Vout uh, described as, uh, as a driver. Um, but I, I, d I mean, we've heard about consumer IoT and industrial IoT. And uh, I, uh, speaking as a former U UK government official, I just wonder where we are in terms of IoT applications in public administrations generally. How, uh, how can these um, applications be developed to meet, in particular, government concerns about uh, security, uh, given that uh, this could be a revolution in the interface between governments and, and, and citizens? So are you, as a dynamic coalition, looking at that particular aspect and talking to governments, you know, what they need uh, assurance about in terms of IoT applications? Thirdly, on uh, Jonathan's point about innovation, I, I was at an interesting session about uh, ethical um, development of technologies, ethical innovation uh, yesterday evening. Uh, Martin, you were there as well, I think. And, um, you know, this, uh, the point I made there was that... Uh, you can strive to innovate ethically, but of course, what direction does IoT, for example, take? It's very difficult to predict. You know, the unforeseen consequences and applications may be positive, may be negative. So how are IoT developers really approaching ethics uh, in a way that's going to ensure that um, uh, these systems and networks are going to be developed with a, with a degree of confidence, given the unpredictability factor. Um, final point, uh, as, as I said, I'm a member of UADIG, so um, uh, UADIG has a call for issues. I really urge the Dynamic Coalition to consider using the uh, UADIG platform uh, forum uh, next June in Vilnius as an opportunity to, uh, to advocate the work, the valuable work you're doing. So the call for issues is out now. Okay, thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, for sure, uh, like any dynamic coalition, I think we also think in different messages to different stakeholder groups of their specific role. So that's a key element. I uh, then, just checking, I realize it's a different part of the day for you, but can you come back on the, the question from Mark and maybe also the remark from Jonathan in the, the, the chat? Am I unmuted? You are. Yeah, yes. Uh, Yes, um, in terms of the um, the U.S. Uh, consumer label, it's it's early days. Um, the FCC just put their notice out uh, back in August, so in the U.S., we're not. It's this is not going to take effect until you know the end of next year at the the earliest. And so I'm happy to to get back with you uh, with more specific information. It, there is some discussion in the uh, the rule that the FCC put out about international harmonization and also working, you know, hand in hand with the White House and with the with the State Department. But I, I would imagine that I'm glad you asked the question that you know this is something that that IGF can take a very active role in um, because this is, is is something I mean with with you know with the Internet of Things something that we've all been working on for. A very very long time, 
Um, so I, I, I'd like to see, um, I'd like to, I'd like to see IGF and the regional IGFs. I mean, sort of begin to take this, this issue up. But in terms of what's the, you know, what's the exact platform, or how you, how do you, how do you do all this? I mean, that's to be determined. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, any last questions in the Zoom room? Okay. In, in the interim, can I, <clears throat> can I make a, a very small, brief response? Good. And then we have a last, um, and then we have a last uh, question in the room, uh, and then okay. the time is flying. It, it's, it's very quick on the issue of the ethical reflection, ethical consideration and control of these IoT devices. This is something, and in particular, their consequences once unleashed. This is a particular concern of many organizations. At the Turing Institute, I'm part of a group called T-Rex, Turing Research Ethics, and, uh, that scrutinizes the Turing Institute's projects for their ethical considerations. Part of this is, of course, making people think about what will happen when these things are turned on. In some cases, you can do this with things like behavioral or psychological or sociological analysis. You can control it and help to make it more predictable with legal uh, mechanisms. But in general, the answer is usually to keep the conversation open, not to tick the ethical box at the beginning of the project and then turn it over to the lawyers to manage the liability, but to keep the information flowing because the problems that we're thinking about are emergent problems. No single party can possibly perceive them, nor can they be analyzed by considering just one layer of this internet. So really the only thing to do is um, attention must be paid and continue to be paid. So I just wanted to make that a uh, small remark. Very, very clear point. Can I invite you to introduce yourself? And Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Elaine Liu. I'm from Singapore. I came to this IGF as an individual learner, uh, not related to work, uh, so I took time off. Uh, so relating to the IoT, I personally feel uh, three points I'd like to share and seek your guidance. First is IoT to me is like an edge devices, uh, data collection devices. It's all about collecting certain data. It can be text, uh, images, and all. I feel that uh, in setting up policies or guardrails, it all depends on the use cases, right? We talk about IoT that's for consumer, IoT that's led to organization, IoT that's a higher level for agency or certain operational resilience, uh, situational awareness, and all. So I think. Uh, does it make sense to have different policy and guardrails depending on the use cases? So that's the first point. The second point is we all know that with hardware, there's software, there's operating system, and at the end of the day, the data analytics that comes out of it. So I think in setting up any uh, guiding principle, we will look at the whole value chain because looking at just the edge or the IoT part, it's just the beginning of it or the starting point. But how it's being consumed and distributed, uh, that's related as well. So I think that's the two points I'd like to share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your, your good observations. Indeed, uh, as it is time, I, I will round off uh, if, 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 if that's okay. Yeah, very, very quickly, regarding the use case, regarding the IoT device or any single devices, right now we have multiple use. Future use is gonna come out. So uh, even though you have a single device, that have the uh, original usage first. Th that's going to be used to the other purposes. So you, we have to think about that. That is the use of the devices going to happen every day. That's we experience in the internet. Yes, thank you. And and uh, just to to at this point to say, indeed, we do. Uh, uh, we are very con uh, conscious that that it's it's data that that it's about that has different uh, applications. I think uh, everything we say is about uh, also the use of IoT in context, whether it's a device or a combination of devices or a service or ecosystem, all with different requirements. 
all with different returns, different risks. And uh, one of the key things that has become more and more uh, visible and uh, is high in the interest also in Singapore, I'm aware, is labeling, informing people about what the risks are they're dealing with, with the stuff they're confronted with. Uh, all the information uh, is to be found also on the DC IoT site. I invite you all to also participate to the uh, to, to subscribe to the list from the Dynamic Coalition on IoT, where we will uh, release uh, main news, but where you can also raise questions or issues, if that's what you like. And we're also very happy with the support of uh, Mediastad uh, that uh, allows us to have supports a, a specific website where we can also have discussions, where we can also share uh, the, the some of the presentations we have. And, and all the reports uh, are available through that as well. Uh, this is an iterative process, so much is clear. The space of change is fast and uh, we're on it because we're where we need it and we want it to serve us in a way that it serves us. Uh, more as a benefit than as a threat. But in the end, it's all risk management as well. So thank you all for your, your interest and uh, speakers for your, your contributions. Uh, I hope to see you uh, in the future, either in a regional event or uh, next year in Riyadh, right? So thank you all very much. This meeting is closed.